Well, good afternoon, everybody. It looks like I have been suddenly recruited into doing the uh, Jesho uh, of this afternoon's speaker. And I have a text. Those of you who suffered through my 40 minutes of spe speaking yesterday, don't worry, this is not nearly as long. <laughs> uh, I'm very pleased to be able to uh, introduce uh, Professor Yen Shretung uh, this afternoon. Uh, many of you know that he received his PhD in political science here at Berkeley, and I was honored to serve on his dissertation committee. And it doesn't say in the introduction, but if I may divert from the text, the prepared text, um, his current work really has very little to do with the subject of his dissertation. His dissertation was really a path-breaking study of Sino-African relations. And he spent time in <clears throat> how many countries in Africa doing interviews and doing field work, which was an extraordinarily brave and path-breaking <clears throat> project. And um, he has so subsequently gone on to a career uh, specializing in Sino-American relations. Anyway, he received his PhD at Berkeley here in 1992 and his MA in International Relations from the Institute of International Relations in 86 and a BA in English from Heilongjiang University in 1982. He's currently the director of the Institute of International Studies at Tsinghua University and the chief editor of the Chinese Journal of International Politics. And again, they left something out. For, for a number of years, he was at the China International Kicker, Center for International Con what does it stand for? C-I-C-I-R. Yeah. For con Contemporary International Relations, yes. He was, uh, he was there for a number of years before going uh, to Tsinghua. <clears throat> He's also a vice chairman of the China Association of International Relations Studies and a vice chairman of the China Association of American Studies. His many books include Analysis of International Relations, The Rise of China and Its Strategy, and International <coughs> Politics in China. In, 19, in 2008, Professor Yen was named as one of the world's top 100 public intellectuals by the American Journal of Foreign Policy. Uh, please join me in welcoming Professor Yen Shretong. Thank you, Tom, for your uh, nice introduction. And also, I think uh, I'm uh, very grateful to uh, Professor uh, Wen Xinye for uh, her uh, invitation and uh, to uh, deliver my deliver speech here and to share my view with you. I'm uh, really very grateful uh, to Berkeley, and without the education at Berkeley, I don't think uh, I can uh, publish uh, uh, these books and articles. And when I graduated, <coughs> when I passed my dissertation, and my advisor, Carl Rosper, told me that, hey, Yan, you got a lifelong title, the uh, Berkeley PhD. And uh, I'm at that time, I really value about this title, but uh, very superficially, I only, or socially. I know Berkeley is a big name. Your doctor of uh, uh, Berkeley is a very, very uh, will be valued by the people. But uh, only after years of research and publication, I realized, realized that the value of the Berkeley PhD is not the title itself. It's not the name of Berkeley. Actually, it's the quality of the Berkeley. And its quality the qualified uh, the, the 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 education quality can make an individual person become a very very qualified scholar. I think uh, that's the substance, and that's why I'm very grateful to Berkeley. Without Berkeley's uh, uh, training, I cannot uh, uh, achieve what I, I did. And uh, actually, before <coughs> I uh, uh, talking about the substance, I want to uh, give you a very brief introduction about my recent research uh, uh, field uh, and the Taiwan issue. And my last article about Taiwan was published in 2008, and immediately after mind you, and uh, uh, hold the office. And since then, on, I did no interview, no TV program, n uh, write no article, and won't say anything about Taiwan. <laughs> and then, <clears throat> so I keep, I keep my mouth shut up. And then my last article about the Taiwan issue was a so was a, a quoted very um, very uh, widely because uh, I apologize for what my uh, misprediction about the possible war between the, uh, the the Taiwan and the mainland China uh, before the 2008 no later than 2008. <clears throat> so since then on, I never say anything, and then people may ask me why you come here to talking about something about the uh, cross-street uh, relationship. 
actually just because of Berkeley. And Berkeley invited me, so I do it. <laughs> and uh, I think I should do anything Berkeley want me to do. <clears throat> okay, uh, I think yesterday, uh, Dr. Su has already uh, give a very uh, clear explanation how we get the term cross street. Actually, before the cross street, the, the term coined, and we, mo in most cases, we use the term uh, Taiwan issue or Taiwan problem. <coughs> and uh, actually, even today at, uh, in China, and these two terms used in different situations. Cross street relationship generally used for something positive. And Taiwan issue is used for something negative. So for, for instance, when we're talking, when we have the problem with the American arms sale to Taiwan, we never see the cross street relationship. We see the Taiwan issue. The Taiwan issue started, not, it's not a new thing. I think everyone here knows that. It started from the 19, uh, 1950. Actually, it's just uh, two years after the issue of the Israel and the Palestinian conflicts. And so this, <clears throat> the Taiwan issue is uh, as durable as the conflicts between ba Pakistan, uh, Palestine and the Israel. And then the question is that, why? How can a conflict is so durable you can never settle down? And uh, <clears throat> it seems to me, at this moment, I don't think anyone can make the prediction when this problem or this issue or conflict can be settled. And most people will make the prediction this issue will continue. The conflict will, will continue. And um, uh, there's a joke in China, and you all know that our soccer team is really uh, awful. They, 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 they are so good, make their uh, a red racer to win the game <laughs> each time. And so uh, both uh, the, the joke is like this. And when the Japanese team went to the temple, pray for the uh, uh, breath, uh, uh, breath from the uh, Buddha. And Buddha tell them that, uh, I'm sorry, in your life, you have no hope to get, uh, to get the final of the World Cup. So the Japanese uh, uh, players cried. And then the South Korean team uh, came in to the temple. They pray for the same uh, blessed from the uh, Buddha. The Buddha told them, I'm sorry, you have no hope in my life <laughs> to, to win the uh, uh, World Cup. So when the Chinese team players come in, they do the same thing. And the, the Buddha was so cold, the Buddha cannot respond to this uh, uh, prayer. The Buddha cried. <laughs> <laughs> well, what I mean? It means that, seems to me, the conflicts between the mainland China and Taiwan is a very, very durable. It's a very difficult to settle down. And uh, Mang Jiu once said that, and uh, he, nev he won't unite it with mainland China in his life. Coincidentally, he's just one year elder than me. That means uh, I, if my health is not better than him, I have no chance to see the unification in my life. Well, then most people believe, and the Taiwan issue never changed, just like the problem between the Israel and the, uh, and the Palestine. Actually, from my understanding, it's different. These two things are not the same. And for the, Palestine, for the, the conflict between Palestine and the Israel, it's, the, it's composed by three factors territory disputes, nat nationality, and the uh, uh, religious uh, 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 difference. And then the problem between the mainland China and Taiwan, the issue varies accordingly. According to what, from my understanding? The issue change in nature according to the relationship between China and the US. In 1950, when China and the US was a rivalry, we are, we are desperate ag against each other. And that, at that time, Taiwan is a threat to the regime security of the PRC. And so that's a really substantial threat. And, uh, but in 1960s, the Kuomintang already lost the capability to sabotage 
the communist government in mainland. And it's no longer that kind of a threat to China. That means uh, the nature of the relationship between the two sides change. The main problem is that for, for the mainland China, Taiwan is an obstacle blocked China to be recognized by the international community. So the issue changed from the security issue into a political issue. In 1970s, after mainland China got its sea spike in the UN, and then it becomes a purely diplomatic issue. It's not that kind of a political issue. And it, cha it also changed. So that situation and it lasted for almost two decades. And, uh, and, and uh, when China and the US cooperate each other as a real strategic partner against the common threat from the Soviet Union, and then the Taiwan is not a problem. It's a, polit it's a problem only super superficially. And so that's why China and the US reached the Shanghai communique. And that communique is very short, only 1,100 Chinese characters. But it has a very, very strong effect. And it stabilized the China-US relationship, consolidated strategic cooperation, and so it strictly stabilized the relationship across the street. And if you look at the, if you do the comparative study with the, the joint statement between Obama and the Chinese, uh, and the, uh, our country in 2009. That's very different. That you want to communicate so long. It's 6,400 characters, six times uh, long, uh, longer than the Shanghai communique. But then it cannot maintain one man's stability. I think it, it just uh, keep that relationship stable for 20, 20, 20 days something. OK, so now come into the 1990s, the situation changed. From my understanding, the, <clears throat> the great opportunity for reunite, uh, 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 the great, no, no, not, uh, it's not an uh, uh, opportunity, uh, almost the waiting for the result of the uh, Hong Kong's uh, formal uh, reunification and uh, make the people in China believe, and uh, we have the chance to unite the whole country, the including Taiwan. So in 1990s, we do have a, a concern to implement full reunification of the country. So then the Taiwan becomes a problem. Taiwan is a problem in one way. First, before the Hong Kong's, uh, uh, the reunification of the Hong Kong, a Taiwan becomes a danger or trigger of the split of China. The split, the clash of the former Soviet Union resulted in 14 countries, no, actually 15 countries, and make the, everyone in China worry about the history will occur to China the same. And then the Taiwan definitely is a, a problem. If Taiwan achieve the independence, and then it may be triggered the, the, the uh, trigger the uh, domino re reaction in, in the mainland. And uh, fortunately, at that time, and uh, uh, Jiang Jingguo did not have the intention to do that. And uh, before the 1993, or maybe 1994, and the Li Denhui are not that uh, determinative for it. So fortunately, we passed that period. And uh, later on, that means uh, in the uh, last, uh, last one and a half day, and uh, people mentioned a lot about the 1995 and 1996. And uh, at that time, and we have a great, we are, we are going to the process of the formal reunification of the Hong Kong and uh, Macau. And these two things are just already on the agenda. And the, the question is the time, when we can uh, implement it. The schedule is there. And then we come, the question is that, whether it's possible to unite Taiwan. And so in 1990s, there's a strong motivation for unif full unification, and Taiwan becomes a problem to prevent China to, impl to implement that goal. Okay, so 
the situation like that continue for quite a long time, and uh, and yesterday I I think that Dr. Su has already give our uh, clear uh, uh, analysis about a different period uh, in 1990s uh, or before the 2008, and then the situation changed in 2008, and from my understanding, the fundamental change actually started from the mainland part, not initiated from the the, the, the Taiwan side. And uh, mind you, take over the position in, in May 20, uh, May 20s. Actually, China changed the policy toward Taiwan from the March of the 2008, two months before that. And uh, our president issued a statement at the political council. And uh, that statement clearly clearly described uh, the new goal of our, foreign pol uh, our policy toward Taiwan. The goal of the policy is, to, is uh, for peace and prosperous. Prosperity means economic development. Peace means uh, we do not use a fo military force to solve the problem. So this is a fundamental change. And uh, fortunately, and this policy was accepted by my NGO's uh, government. And uh, both sides and started to work to each other and to build up the confidence in each other and uh, build up the mutual trust. And so then we can maintain the last three years uh, uh, stability. And nowadays people really think, hey, the things already changed, everything, ch everything becomes nice and uh, we don't need to worry about the situation turn by. And uh, then I think uh, the, everyone knows the history. I just want to focus on, uh, uh, focus on the future. And uh, in terms of, <clears throat> of being the political scientist, I know it's risky to make any political prediction. I already misprepredicted the possible war <laughs> uh, in 2008. So it's a, I know how, how dangerous it is. But now if we want to know, if we want to understand the situation, we still need to predict and uh, what the possibilities uh, may occur in the future. And uh, in short term, oh, I, before I uh, make my prediction, I will say, there's some misunderstanding in both mainland China and Taiwan. They always use the term eventually. From my understanding, this is a very unscientific term. What do I mean eventually? <laughs> eventually means that uh, before the distinct, distinct, distinction of the human being. <laughs> the thousand, maybe 10,000 years, 100,000 years, who knows? And so eventually doesn't mean anything. So if we want, want to make a prediction, we need the time limit. So first, uh, I want to make the prediction about the next two years. That means uh, the the rest of the time of uh, uh, the, the, the uh, Hu Jintao. And uh, from understanding the situation possibly next year is not, I mean the, the, the relationship between the mainland China and Taiwan and uh, may not be as stable as this year. The reason is that, and uh, mind you, need to take some policy tilted toward the independence for winning the election. And uh, I do not mean that uh, this is a determining factor for him to win the uh, uh, presidential uh, campaign. But for secure, for ensure the victory, he need to. So very recently, I forgot who mentioned that, mind you, ask his uh, subordinates and uh, don't call Milan, uh, uh, China uh, don't, don't, don't call the uh, other side China. Call it uh, mainland China. And it's a very positive. And then, from my understanding, this uh, positive behavior means something else. It means, mind you, try to ensure the trust from the mainland China and to consolidate the mutual a confidence for his further policy 
toward independence. He needs that policy for victory, and then he wants to ensure mainland China, hey, I'm not uh, willing to, but uh, I have to. And uh, I hope you can understand this is just a technique change for the victory. After the campaign, presidential uh, 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 election, after this election, I, w I can come back, I, I can turn back to my uh, uh, current policy. So I think this strategy is used for the consolidating, uh, consolidating the uh, mainland China's uh, trust in him and for him to uh, make a step toward the, make the policy tilted toward the independence. And uh, this, uh, from my understanding, um, generally speaking, this strategy will work. And because the mainland China do not want to sabotage the current relationship with Taiwan. And meanwhile, and the mainland Chinese government and do not want to DPP have more chance to win the election. So our government and mind you, and actually share, have a shared interest to beat DPP in the next election. That's common interest. And so I think, mind you, at this moment, just need to, uh, is working on to improve more mutual understanding uh, on this. But that doesn't mean that if the government can, governments agree with each other, uh, both sides understand each other, then you can maintain the stability. I would say the society may respond to mind use policy in different way. I don't think uh, these two sides, ad administrators uh, can tell the people, oh, don't, don't worry about that, and uh, this is uh, a political show, and nothing real. Neither side can tell the people that, okay, well, this is a show, this is not, not a real thing, not real policy. And so how the media responds to mind use policy, I don't know. But the people will be led by the media, not by the government. So that's why I'm uh, worried a little bit more than Dr. Su. I think possibly the cross-street relationship will become intense, intense by later this year rather than next year. Okay, after, no matter my NGO or DPP win the election, for my understanding, they will continue the current, in general, they will continue current policy. Even the DPP at this moment do not have a common or uh, uh, common uh, common uh, 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 mainland China policy. But uh, I think I don't think they have uh, other choice. They just will give a new label to mind use policy because uh, mind use policy toward mainland China was accepted. Not at this moment, not only by the mainland China, and also accepted by the U.S. And when China and the U.S. can accept the same policy, and that's the best policy for the Taiwan Authority. It's very simple. They both sides are satisfied with you, and so you can you can do, uh, uh, you can do uh, uh, you can get support from. Me. And uh, from my understanding, and. Uh, U.S. will not only will happy with the what my NGO said. I think uh, U.S. actually think uh, my NGO's policy is uh, very creative. This policy achieved what America wants in 1950s. Uh, Professor Scalapino uh, was not here. Actually, Pros Professor Scalapino and his colleagues and invented this idea of a two-China policy. So at that time, American administration talked with the Jiang kai Now you have two alternatives, and one Taiwan, one China, or two Chinas. Now we see these things very often. We have two Yemen, two Gongo, many twos, two Koreans, many. That's a very popular practice, political practice after the World, 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 World War II. 
or during the Cold War. And these suggestions was rejected by the Jiang Kai-shek government. Well, for a very long time, American government concerned the two China policy is uh, the best policy to protect Americans' strategy or Americans' interests, strategic interests in this region. Because that policy, on the one hand, can constrain China from United the, uh, Taiwan. On the other hand, it meant to keep the Taiwan as a mutual allies to US forever. So, and also, the third benefit is that the two China policy has a less danger to cause mutual conflicts. Two China policy is more possibly to can stabilize this uh, uh, situation. So, for my understanding, actually, Mangju's policy is uh, very clever. He did not uh, give the name as a two China policy. And uh, I think yesterday, and uh, Dr. Su has, has uh, already told you that, they cleverly invented the term, 92 consensus. Well, no matter what the name, what the title, the content is the same, the liquor is the same, the, leak, the degree of the, the, the percentage of the alcohol is the same. And uh, this two China policy from my understanding and uh, will continue, will can maintain the current uh, stability until uh, uh, the uh, end of the uh, uh, 2012. After that, if mind you lose, and uh, the, the, the DPP win the election, I don't think the DPP will change the shift from two China policy to the one, uh, one China, one Taiwan. That policy becomes uh, so stupid, has already proved by the history and the Chen Shui Bian's rule. And so I, I think no one says, hey, let's repeat that. And if you repeat that, means repeat the failure, right? So I don't think that anyone will repeat the failure. And uh, so they say, my angel's policy is very good. What do we need? We just need to invent a term to replace 92 consensus, but we won't change the uh, uh, content. Well, if Ma ying win the uh, 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 election from Anderson, he will continue the two China policy. But it cannot be exactly the same like today. The sec during the second term, he needs some historical records. And he needs to take some brief action to achieve something in terms of uh, foreign policy, he need to enlarge the international space. I don't think mind you will be satisfied with this uh, observation, one observation in the health, uh, uh, World, uh, World Health Organization only. He need more, he wants more. I don't know how much he push, but definitely he will enlarge the, he will spend the efforts on enlarge the inter, uh, international space for, uh, for, uh, for Taiwan. So this will be the same like the DPP. The difference is that in the second term of Mangju, oh, he uh, replaced by DPP, and the policy is that they still, the nature or the character of the policy is two China policy, but they a little bit uh, harder or aggressive than uh, this term. That's uh, my concern. Well, the, the conflict is never caused by one side. The question is not uh, how much the Taiwan push for enlarging international space. And also, it depends on how, in what way the mainland China responds to that policy. Okay. Now, the first two years is safe, and then we're talking about the next uh, uh, four years after the 2002. During this period, that's really depend on, I think this uh, is depend on the, the change of our leadership. And we are going to change the leadership by 2000, 2012. And this generation and a little bit different from the previous generation, or from the current leadership. And uh, currently, the, our, uh, the Politburo's are those people and who 
graduate from the school and go to the work and have a lot of experience in the bureaucracy and the administration. But they do not have experience of a harsh life. What I mean harsh life? I mean the, the people of my generation and sent to, to the countryside. And that kind of life, you cannot imagine. It's, I don't think it's easier than a war. I can tell you how harsh at that time. And uh, I, my farm once was uh, totally blocked by the snow, the heavy snow. We cannot get out of the farm. We have no salt for three months, no vegetable, nothing. Every day, we can only eat the pancake with some water. We have no water. The, the water, the only water we have for drink, we don't have water for washing face. And uh, we don't have the enough uh, energy to warm the room. So the ass on the wall, that's sick. And every morning we woke up and we used our mouth to uh, uh, melt the corner, the, the corner of the uh, towel and use the corner to clean the face. And we do not take off the clothes uh, to sleep because it's too cold, you have to wear it. And uh, under the, under 40, 42 degree, the, 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 uh, the minor, the minor 40, uh, uh, 42 degree, and uh, we, can, we can see through the uh, uh, roof. And that kind of a life make my generation very tough. And I think the comic book by Princeton University Press and will have an interview about me <laughs> about that life. The people, uh, some people attribute my realist uh, view <laughs> to that uh, harsh life. But I should say, this harsh life really make people of my generation different from the others. And uh, what's the basic, what's the general character for people of my generation? We don't think there's any difficulties we cannot overcome. We have confidence in ourselves. We can survive. I can, you can throw me to the street. I know I can survive. Well, I do not need any penny. I can survive. And anywhere, you throw me there, and uh, we can survive. Not my children. And uh, they, without credit card, they don't know how to survive. <laughs> right? Different. And not like my parents. And without the government, they don't know how to survive. But we survive on ourselves. And uh, Xi Jinping and uh, Wang Qishan, they are all the, 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 uh, uh, the, the, the what we call it, uh, the usually, what, the youth sent to uh, uh, <laughs> sent down youth, yeah. This, I thought from my understanding, and uh, their personal characteristic will have some impact on the policy. And I'm not so sure their personal characteristic will have a strong impact on their policy to Taiwan, but from my understanding, their personal character will inevitably have impact on China's uh, uh, policy. And, uh, and the second factor, first two years plus another four years means six years. In six years, China's economy will quickly narrow the gap with the US. Some people already make the prediction. And China's GDP may catch up with the US by 2010. I'm not so sure we can do that so fast. But if according to the current status, China's GDP is already, and uh, it's already, uh, I think, uh, almost 40% of the US. And uh, because of the poverty in China, and we can maintain the high growth of the economy from understanding for, for another eight or 10 years. This is really irony. The fast growth of China's economy is not because we are rich, it's because we are poor. We're poor, so we can, the people, the, salary, the, the workers' salary is very low. And the, the cost of production is, uh, 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 is low and make the economy growing very fast. So this may be Marxist analysis. And if you want to make a benefit, actually from understanding, 
benefit is a good term for what? And <laughs> for the surplus value, right? The surplus value is a bad, bad thing, but there are actually two, two labels for the same liquor. And uh, this poverty issue cannot be solved within the next uh, eight years. And then the low price still is a major engine make our economy growing fast. Very recently, and uh, our president uh, bring a big delegation to your country and uh, hope this businessman can invest in the U.S. to help the U.S. Uh, to, uh, to solve the problem of unemployment. And uh, I, what I heard from those, uh, those people and uh, uh, those businessmen and visit the U.S., they said that U.S. is a very nice place for live but not for investment. The rate of profit is too low. I said, why we invest the money somewhere we cannot make big money? And in China, the rate of profit is so high. They said, why we leave this market for others' capital, and then we invest our money to somewhere and, uh, with a low, pro uh, uh, low rate of profit? So from my understanding, and the high rate of the profits based on the low salary will give the China's economy its strength. And if China continue 10% growth of this economy, it means the GDP will be doubled in seven years. Seven years, it means and uh, 12 trillion. The, the US now is a 15 trillion, right? And that means 12 trillion. And I doubt at that time, Americans' uh, GDP can rose to 20 trillion, no. Maybe 15 to 18 trillion, something like that. We keep the 3% growth every year. And so when this gap strongly, uh, 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 dramatically narrowed, from my understanding, and the, the US will give a more concern about China's uh, policy. That means US will prefer more cooperative policy with China, and U.S. will, will concern more how to avoid a conflict with China, especially on the Taiwan issue. Because neither China nor U.S. want to have the major clashes at Taiwan. And also we know that if we can keep the Taiwan issue from uh, triggering the war between China and U.S., there's nothing can bring war between China and the U.S. That's the only thing dangerous issue. So from understanding, the, the gap, the economic gap narrowed between China and the U.S. will be, bring more cooperation between the China and the U.S. on the Taiwan issue. That, that's my concern. So from understanding, I don't know how do the Taiwan Authority adjust to this the change, how to adjust the China and the U.S. relationship. And this morning, people already, I think, uh, Wu Yushan <laughs> gave a very good uh, argument. And uh, the grass and uh, always worry about the elephants. They do not only worry about they do not only worry about the fight between the elephants, and they also worry about the, the elephants make love. Right? Neither fight or love, and uh, they, they, they cause the damage of the grass. So the, how the Taiwan can maintain that position? And from understanding, and it becomes uh, more difficult than today, rather than easier than today. And uh, you already, I think yesterday people already illustrated the situation. And uh, actually, not only economically, and also militarily, I think uh, the table and the turned toward the uh, Chinese side. And uh, well, this is uh, what I'm concerned for the the term eight years. And then I, I cannot make the prediction for, <laughs> for, for a thousand years, a hundred years, even the, uh, 20 years. Let's talking about uh, the possibility 15 years. And from understanding, and uh, there is no way to see the unification in 15 years. I'm a guy strongly advocating for the unification of Taiwan, but I know it's uh, impossible. And uh, yesterday, Yushan has already show, uh, illustrated the 
national identity in Taiwan has changed a lot. The populate, uh, actually, if you let people to only make the choice between two identities, Taiwanese and the Chinese, I'm 100% sure that uh, the population of the Taiwanese will be uh, over 80%. And the people identify them as Chinese, in any case, cannot be less than 20. And actually, nowadays, uh, when they have the three uh, uh, choices, you find that the Chinese, uh, the, the, the population identified as Chinese already go down less than 10, maybe, maybe nine. And the last two years, or no, last three years, the st stabilize the relationship across the Taiwan Street. Didn't, uh, didn't uh, help to st stop this situation. In the last three years, you can check the number, and uh, the population of uh, population identified as Chinese still growing, and the population as Chinese still going down. I don't think we can change the situation because human beings' national identity was fostered by the environment, mainly by the primary school and the middle school education. And the, our policy toward Taiwan, the so-called three rules, three enter. Enter hard, enter society, enter water, I forgot. <laughs> I doubt. I, oh, I enter family, yeah. If we can really enter family, and uh, increase the cross marriage and by 100 times, if possible, if, if we send 20 million uh, brides <laughs> to the Taiwan, we can change their pop, uh, population identity. But I doubt Taiwan will allow that many Chinese girls to, to, to mar marry the uh, uh, Taiwan, uh, Taiwanese. OK. So if. If you cannot change the social environment, you cannot uh, change the trend of the change of the national identity in this island. Then the question is come. How can we achieve peaceful unification? Peaceful unification based on what? Based on the other side, the weaker side accepted. Now we, we have to ask why those people in Taiwan identify themselves as Taiwanese, will accept the reunification. I cannot see any reason for them to do it. Some people argue that, hey, when we're rich, we can buy it. We'll give them money. Well, in our human history, you have never have any single case a power can buy unification. It's never happened. And so the peaceful unification based on what? And uh, the, identity, the trend of the change of an identity is an uh, unfavorable situation. And the money actually is uh, irrelevant. And that's why, from my understanding, Manju administration do not worry about the economic integration. The economic integration between the US and Canada, from my understanding, much closer than the cross street relationship. Now, I doubt Canadian will accept American requirement to be the part of the United States. And if the common language, common ideology, common political, uh, common political system, and the common culture cannot make the U.S. and the Canada as one, I doubt why the traditional common Chinese culture can make the Taiwan part of the China. And uh, I don't think we can achieve that based on the cultural power. OK. If the money doesn't work, the culture doesn't work, what works? Only when Taiwan feels they have no other choice. They, they will be forced to accept the reunification rather than they are willing to. What can force them? And only when the US give up the security protection. And the US tell the Taiwan, I'm sorry. You should protect yourself. Live on yourself. 
No more credit card from me. You to earn the money by yourself. And at that time, and I think Taiwan have no choice. They will accept the peaceful unification, and then will bargain, and then will benefit economically. And then they will concern and what's the major interest for, for people on that island. And that's, so that's why I think these things won't happen in 15 years. And also, if my, based on my analysis, and the, the peaceful reunification is based on the gap, the military gap between China and the US. If we cannot substantially reduce the military gap with the US, it's a very difficult to achieve a peaceful unification. How fast we can do it? And uh, obviously, now, not, I think uh, today, today's newspaper and, uh, said that China's uh, resumed two-digit growth of the military budget in uh, today's newspaper. And uh, I think uh, that's a positive. And uh, because if we do not uh, increase the military budget in th at that rate, we can never narrow down the metro gap with the US. Last year, we reduced the increased rate of metro budget to 7%. And then, actually, everyone knows that. Last year, the inflation rate is really high. From my understanding, the inflation is at least 50% of the increase, maybe more the officially, because officially it's a three point or something. And actually, the real thing is that possibly they eat up all of them. And so this year, from my understanding, the inflation is still very high. And also, today's newspaper said that Wen Jiabao, our prime minister, and uh, tell the Congress, the number one task for the government this year is to constrain the inflation. So what does it mean? It means the inflation will be pretty high. So whenever, you know, when we call for the people to learn from Lei Feng, what do I mean? <laughs> the moral morality is declining. So anything becomes the first, first, first uh, uh, priority of the government work. It means uh, something urgent. I think the same for the Taiwan Authority, American government, every government. The first priority is also always something very urgent, very difficult to deal with. So from my understanding, and China need to increase if they want to. I mean that if they want to achieve the peaceful reunification, they have no other approach except an increase the military budget and to narrow down the military gap between China and the US. Okay, how long it will take? I don't know. I'm not a technology. I, I have no knowledge about the military uh, weapons and the military capability. But uh, at this moment, this gap is really large. And the, the gap between China and the U.S. in terms of military, it, from my understanding, the, the most, the largest gap is not equipment. Certainly, equipment, there's a gap in terms of equipment. The substantial gap between China, the PLA, and the US troops is the experience of war. Our troops have no war experience for almost 30 years, from 1984, 20, 20, 27 years. And the troops without a real experience in the battle, no matter how good weapons they're equipped, you can hardly believe there, you can hardly to trust their capability. And so from my understanding, this peaceful reunification is a really uh, difficult task for the mainland China to achieve. Well, the second thing, the second thing is that in 2008, we clearly declared the goal of the policy toward Taiwan is a peace and the uh, uh, prosperity. Unification is not the first priority of the policy. I don't know how long this policy can continue. Next two years, no problem. And six, eight years, 
and also po possible. But I cannot guarantee that our policy toward Taiwan will be defined as that forever. That means if we define that two goals as our policy toward Taiwan, it's no difference from giving up the unification. And so, from my understanding, if we, do not, we did not have the intention to unite Taiwan in 1960s, and we couldn't have that kind of problem, right? Because uh, we do not want to unite Taiwan, and Taiwan said, okay, fine. And so the current situation, stability, I from understand, based on the change of the policy of both sides, both mainland China and the Taiwan. Okay, the final thing is that, final thing is about the, how can we, uh, what we can expect it for this uh, two side. For my understanding, if China spend every effort on the peaceful reunification, it's a long-term issue, very long. And um, during this uh, period, there will be a lot, lot of uh, up and downs. This up and downs, from my understanding, and uh, mainly the small up and downs, mainly determined by the Taiwan Authority. If they change the leadership every four years, I mean the two parties shift their positions, and then the policy is not stable. There's always some change in degree. I do not mean change in nature. But uh, this uh, kind of a change of the leadership or ruling party and possibly cause the, 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 the uh, bumpy relationship across the Taiwan Strait. And in the long run, the relationship from understanding is uh, determined by or the, the general situation is determined by the China and the U.S. relationship. And uh, people do not like the Cold War, certain also do not like the MAD, the Mutual Assured Destruction Strategy. But then we have to admit it that since we have a nuclear weapons, the number of the war becomes less and less. And the scale of the war becomes small and small. And the casualty of the war and uh, dwindled. So the nuclear weapons, in some way, ensured the strategic relationship between China and the U.S. In what way? In at the level of no war. That means that neither side can afford the nuclear war because of nuclear weapon, because the threat of nuclear weapon, and both sides will be very cautious about our relationship. And that's a positive part. I think in the future, and before we can invent some weapons and to nullify the political function of nuclear weapons, and the world, the China-US relationship, or the stability of China-US relationship in some way still need that, or re rest on that condition. And uh, so let me wrap up my uh, uh, presentation. And the first, I think uh, I'm uh, really optimistic about the cross-strait relationship. That means uh, it's a very slight chance to see military clashes across the Taiwan Strait. Even DPP came to power because I think DPP will learn from the Chen Shui Bian's policy. They know they cannot go too far. They will constrain their behavior. So that's, the, that, that's a, a one factor for, uh, for me to be optimistic. The second factor is that the gap, that means the power gap between China and the US will be narrowed in the visible future. I don't know, no one can guarantee that China will definitely surpass the US. No one can guarantee that. But the invisible future, I mean, say in the next 10 years, is possible to see the, the power gap to be narrowed. And then this factor will be positive, make, make both sides and looking for a positive or the peaceful settlement of the Taiwan issue. I don't mean say we can settle them, but uh, then you give them a, the opportunity and uh, the, make them have that kind of help or the political expectation. 
And uh, the other factors make me feel the optimistic about the relationship. Certainly, being a Chinese, not the Chinese in culture, but Chinese in nationality, and uh, I think uh, it's, a, it's, it's a very difficult to expect it, the reunification in my life. So if people tell me that, hey, after you, the two sides will be united as one, I will tell him, that's not my business. Why I care something after me? <laughs> that's uh, that's my, my, my children's <laughs> problem. Let them to handle. Uh, just like you cannot uh, ex uh, Qin Shi Huang never worry about uh, the Taiwan issue 2,000 years ago. Yeah. <laughs> People worry about their, something in their life. Well, no, I don't think they worry about something about after their life. So in that way, I think it's a, I'm pessimistic about the reunification. The second factor that, and the political system in Taiwan inevitably will give the Taiwan, uh, will give DTPP chance to win the power. They may not win 2012, but they have a chance to win it next time by 2012, uh, 2016 or 2020. And anyone stayed in power, any party stayed in power for more than 10 years, and people were tired of it, right? Look at the situation in the Middle East. And the, and the leaders stay there for over 20, 30, 40 years, and then no matter what they did, and people they want to change. People want something fresh. And so when TVP ca came to power, I don't think anyone can stop them from pushing for so-called enlarged international uh, uh, space to legitimize the independence and to consolidate the sovereignties. They will do anything. But certainly, positive side is limited. The negative side, they, they, uh, they, they definitely will do it. So, so the final I will say, and uh, in, the, in the general, in the, the, the strategic level, I think uh, we can be optimistic about uh, the peace, peaceful situation. But uh, at technical level, I think uh, there will be a lot of uh, bumpy evidence or the accidents the term used by Dr. Su yesterday. I think uh, the, the, the accidents will happen quite often. Thank you, thank you very much. Yes? Thank you very much. That was a very interesting and another, a third in our very meaty and thought-provoking keynote speeches. So I really appreciate that. Um, when you put a lot of emphasis in your talk on narrowing the military gap between the U.S. and China as a mechanism for facilitating un peaceful unification of uh, Taiwan and, and China. And <coughs> It made me think of the Soviet Union. It made me think of a particular theory of the fall of the Soviet Union, which was that the Soviet Union, in an effort to narrow or maintain a narrow military gap between the Soviet Union and the United States, spent itself into oblivion, they spent more than they could afford. It, do you think that there is any danger that pushing so many resources toward narrowing the military gap between the U.S. and China could uh, create a similar kind of outcome for the PRC? Mm -hmm. That's a very good question, and I think the many people uh, believe that the collapse of the former Soviet Union because of the arms race, and they are at the weak side. They waste the economic resources for arms race, so they collapse. Actually, that's not my understanding. If an arms race can make a Soviet Union collapse, it at least cannot uh, undermine the U.S. strength. Why the U.S. benefit from the arms race rather than being hurt by the arms race? And uh, actually, there's a lot of arm, arms race. Arms race between the Israel and the Palestinian. Arms race between South Korea and North Korea. And the arms race uh, between the, uh, the, the, what are they, the, the uh, ones between the, uh, Brazil and the, the, the Chile. But then nothing happened. From my understanding, the collapse of former Soviet Union is because the speed of the reform. And uh, Gorbachev made a mistake. He did, I don't know whether he drive the car or not, 
And driving a car, the important thing is to keep the speed. If you speed in the car, and then it's very dangerous and very possible to have an accident. So at that time, Gorbachev accepted this suggestion from the World Bank, so-called the, uh, the shock reform. The, what do you mean shock? Shock means you make you uh, change dramatically in very short period. That's very dangerous. It's dangerous for any country. And so that's why China adopt, learned from the Russian experience and we insist on the graduism. That means uh, we change, but change slowly. Even today, on the exchange rate, <laughs> China said, we definitely appreciate the renminbi, but uh, we will do it very slowly. <laughs> and uh, we, pro we promise to US, we definitely will appreciate the renminbi over 10%, but in five years, not one year. So the graduism, that means uh, the, the proper speed can in some way help your, your, your policy to achieve the goal. For China, if you look at the, the metro budget, even the increase by digital uh, uh, rate, what it mean? It's less than 3% of the GDP. Normally, for a major power, they should keep their metro budget at 3 to 3.5% 3 of the GDP. So from my understanding, China, there's a large room for China to increase the metro budget. But unfortunately, because the country was uh, so much and uh, indulged in the money issue, and the firmly believe them, the money is the only important value of the life, so they don't want to spend the money on the military. And they concern, hey, you spend money on military, you cannot uh, make more money. So everyone wants to make more money. And that kind of uh, ideology, or the, I call it uh, money worship, and prevent the large increase of a major party. So I don't think uh, we need to worry about that. I'd also like to, also like to thank you for your, your uh, rich presentation. You, I can't remember the exact words you used, but it was something to the effect of, uh, Taiwan's straight conflict was the only thing that would draw the United States into a military conflict with China. Mm -hmm. And I want to pick, I think it was something that Sarah said yesterday about thinking regionally, is with what is seen in <coughs> the United States in particular as China's new assertiveness in the region all the way from Korea down to Southeast Asia and possibly down beyond that. Um, is it possible that the United States, because of our military alliances with many of the countries in Southeast Asia, Korea, Japan, and so on, might, for other reasons, be drawn into some sort of a conflict with China, certainly accidentally, but and not willingly, but mm -hmm. this is something that needs to be considered. Okay. The answer is uh, uh, still inconsistent with my uh, previous one, no. And uh, first, and uh, one case can illustrate why neither China and the U.S. want to fall into war for others' interests. And uh, when North Korea, shared the South Korea's uh, islands. And uh, that's already something. And, but then, there's no one think that kind of uh, behavior will cause war, let alone the war between China and the US. And uh, then, it won't cause a war between the South Korea and North Korea. So when I <coughs> attended a meeting at the South Korea, they said this situation is very dangerous. And if North Korea continue like that, I, said, I tell them that I think this is uh, very safe. And look at that. And you claim your warship was sank by North Korea. Nothing happened. And uh, North Korea shell your islands, and nothing happened. And if the, your, uh, your territory was uh, shelled, bombed by others, cannot cause war. How can you have any situation more peaceful than this? <laughs> the, the people won't go to war for even their being militarily attacked. So from my understanding, in this region, and you must remember that, this is uh, one of the most uh, peaceful regions in the world. And uh, for East Asia, there's no real war. I mean war, not a metro clashes, like uh, kill uh, three or uh, two person. I mean so the real war, according to the CIPRI's uh, uh, standard, and that means uh, the casualty is uh, about uh, uh, 1,000 people, uh, 1, 
persons related to the war. And uh, there's uh, no war in this region since uh, 1991, when the war in the Cambodia ended. Even the Europe, in the last uh, three de uh, two decades, they experienced a war in the Chechnya, Kosovo War, and, and uh, uh, the uh, war in the, uh, 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 Virgi uh, Virginia, and the, and the uh, what, Machidun. And so you can find any, from my understanding, this region is uh, very safe in terms of war. But uh, I do not mean that uh, there's, this, is, this region is uh, uh, very secure. Secure means uh, no uncertainty. Actually, there's a lot of uncertainty here. That means uh, the conflicts will be there. But this conflict, from my understanding, is uh, manageable. And uh, manageable means they won't bring about war between the countries. I think we, we've been privileged to hear the thoughts of uh, Yen Shui Tong, and uh, certainly one of the most provocative and interesting thinkers in Chinese political science. Uh, two questions. Um, first, can you explain how your thinking has changed, how the thoughts of Yen Shui Tong have changed since the time you predicted war between Taiwan and why they've changed? how and why they've changed and why your assumptions have uh, changed. And second, what we really want to know, of course, is what the CCP leadership thinks and what, to what extent, how would you judge the CCP leadership's thinking and how they've changed, how the, how the leadership's thinking about Taiwan has changed? Thank you. Okay. My change is that because before my last uh, article, I still think and the Taiwan Authority will push for the legitimized independence. They, are, they will never satisfy with the independence de facto. They needed independence de rule. And that pressure, not only from the DDEP, but also from the people, along with the change of the identity uh, in Taiwan, and more and more people will be, be, feel the kind of a humiliation internationally. And then for these young people, they will say that, hey, we want to be treated as a first class citizen in the world. We don't want to treat it as second class citizen in the world. They cannot accept it. And then this social pressure will force the Taiwan Authority move towards legitimate independence. And Meanwhile, from my understanding, as China, the younger generation, I mean uh, my children's generation, changed a lot from the people of my generation. And uh, this generation, so-called one-child generation, they grown up in a relatively, relatively uh, wealth, uh, 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 well uh, 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 environment. So they are not that hungry for money but they're really hungry about the value. They, they, they regard the value as very important in, to their individuals. So a recent poll shows that 95% of the kids of the rich people has no intention or interest to take over their family business. None of them want to do it. They, this, in some way, they regarded that their parents beyond their dignity. They said, uh, they, they, they are the money, they're money machine. They don't know what is a human's life. They, they only work hard for money. They think it's worthless. So I think uh, this generation change will make have a different view about the unification of the country. So at that time, I believe, I mean, so before 2008, I believe that, well, and that this situation the, the, the identity change in the Taiwan will make the things uh, move to the wall. In what way I change? When our government issued the new policy, and then I found that this policy acceptable to Taiwan authority, no matter the DPP or 
the uh, community. As long as the both the government have both sides agree to maintain the current status, there's no danger war. That means that both both sides say, okay, let's keep it like this. And then no one wanted anything more. That's why I think that, okay, I my prediction is definitely wrong because this kind of situation cannot change in short term. So if we, just now I said that in the eight years, it won't change. Then why I studied something happened after eight years, no one knows. So I no longer I keep my mouth shut up. And uh, about the government, I think uh, for the government to change, it's based on the philosophy. And uh, what's the uh, most effective way to maintain the current status? Because during the Chen Shui Bian's period, the status, it becomes difficult to maintain the status. Chen Shui Bian pushed very hardly. How can you do it? And uh, there are three suggestions. You force the Taiwan Authority to give up, to step back. And then, then what? You make them to accept, be satisfied with the current status. And so, obviously, the later strategy and, uh, was accepted. So they issue a new policy and uh, start talking, no longer talking about uh, how to unite Taiwan. They started talking about how to maintain the current status. So this change from my understanding, the, the change of the goal, and uh, along with the strategy, and make the situation stable. Now I've linked several points in your uh, speech and also in your answering together, and I have this picture. The reason that uh, you said that you made a wrong prediction of 2008 seems to be that uh, uh, you didn't think that um, the Beijing government would put preventing independence ahead of maintaining status quo. That is, they have resequenced their priorities in such a way that their current preference ordering is quite similar to the KMT's preference ordering. So that Hu Jintang and Ma and Jiu can really talk to each other because they all want to maintain status quo. They all want to prevent Taiwan independence, and so there will be peace. Um, I would like to scratch that a little bit and ask you um, along uh, Lower Dittmer's question, why is it that um, Hu Jintao made that change? Is this because of the, DP, uh, the DPP's behaviors so that Taiwan independence became a larger danger than status quo and so this change of policy. And also you mentioned that in 2008, this um, policy preference for peace and prosperity and not unification, you wonder how this 2008 platform can be maintained. And you also mentioned that generation perspectives would have an impact. And I'm not that um, clear about what you mean by this generational change and this impact. Does it mean that the future generations, those who put value above money, would be more pro-unification, or would they be more status quo? Uh, so I think the um, critical issue is really, why is it that they change the sequence, the, the preference ordering um, um, in 2008, and how long can that be sustained? For according to your theory, if that preference ordering is uh, maintained, then there would be no problem, no war, only peace across the Taiwan Strait, because you know, 
both sides will think the same way, and it will be a two China formula without the name of two China. Well, the first question about the change of the priority of the goal of the policy. And uh, from my understanding, there's uh, uh, the most uh, important factor to make this uh, the adjustment of the policy is the policy analysis, or oh, the evaluation of the chance of my induced uh, election. And at that time, from my understanding, the evaluation is that my NGO has a great chance to win the election. DPP have no chance. And second factor is also very important and uh, already uh, raised by Dr. Su is the confidence with the Kuomintang. Before that, and the Lian Zhang has already visited China. And uh, so these things make the, the, the politicians has uh, developed their uh, confidence in each other. They know if they manage to win the election and he will not repeat Chen Shui-bian's policy. And so they have confidence in that. And this is not a guess, this is confidence. So first, because they know the my, they, they, their, their judgment is that Ma Anjou definitely will win the election. Second, Ma Anjou definitely will change Chen Shui-bian's policy. So they concern our policy very possible and accepted by Ma Anjou's government. So that's why they change. Second, about the generation change and the impact of generation change on the policy. I think the generation change on the policy and takes time because it, they take time for them to hold the power. And maybe 25 years, and now they are 20, 20, 20 something, and another 25 years when they hold the power. And then they will tell us what kind of policy they prefer. And uh, in, if we're talking about 25 years, according to the recent prediction, and China's GDP definitely will surpass the US. 25, that means uh, 2000, uh, 2037. And uh, even the latest prediction is that China will surpass the US uh, by 2030. So when China's economy is larger than the US, and uh, when one child generation holds the power, and uh, I don't think uh, they are, they will be so, what are they, they I don't think uh, they will continue today's policy. And they will, uh, they are forced to reconsidering what is your responsibility for the world. And because of the China's position and uh, make them consider that. Certainly, it may, may some unexpected thing happen. And uh, currently political corruption is a serious problem. Right, bipolarization is a serious problem. These factors are it's a, may detour the China's growth, detour China's the track China becomes the next superpower. You don't know, but anyhow, and if the China's economy can surpass the U.S. and when the one child generally hold the power, I think the policy will change a lot. Maybe of Taiwan the same. In 25 years, I doubt there's uh, more than 5% people identify themselves as Chinese, maybe 2% or something. And uh, at that time, and uh, I, I doubt this, uh, the, the, the people will accept this, uh, the, the, the current status, they also want to change. So then the third factor will be very important, is the uh, American's policy. And if uh, Americans policy tell that, hey, no, I don't want to see any change here, and the U.S. still have that capability to maintain, because 30, even 25 years, I'm not so sure China's military can surpass the U.S. And if U.S. is still our number one military power, can use the power to maintain the stability, it's still safe. But then there's a lot of uh, conflicts, politically, not military, like that. So. From my understanding, because of my field is international security, my concern is that as long as there's no war, well, it's fine. No matter the, how much diplomatic or political conflicts, well, the human beings life, and even couples may divorce, right? They love each other, <laughs> then they divorce. So how can you make the uh, two uh, Taiwan, uh, uh, make Taiwan, the, the, the mainland China has no problem. So from my understanding, as long as we can 
prevent from a war, the other things manageable. I, uh, I'm from Taiwan. Um, I think since the 1970s, when ROC was de-recognized by the U.S., um, there was a sort of uh, like national identity crisis. And over time, Taiwanese people tend to equate or associate, tend to e associate or even equate China with the Communist Party. Um, so I think once the mainland China um, liberalized politically, the national identity polls numbers today will probably be very different. S um, I obviously, that's a much harder goal than uh, exceeding U.S. in GDP terms. But I would like to, I would like to ask you, if, like, what do you think the role of mainland intellectual uh, is in the political liberalization of uh, mainland China in the future? Mm -hmm. Well, actually. In our tradition, we regarded the intellectual as a heart of the society. But now, the heart is not that good as before. <laughs> the, the pollution not only polluted the physical environment, and also polluted people's heart. And so the morality becomes a big problem. And so that's why some intellectuals, and you may find that they, nowadays we, have, we call it guo uh, xue and the rediscover traditional uh, 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 tradi uh, tradition, not only in political science, in IR, but also in music, in many fields. For my understanding, the engine behind this uh, momentum is uh, people's uh, hatred to the decline of the morality. And uh, some intellectuals concerned that we need to resume the traditional morality. For instance, and uh, in the Chinese culture, and uh, the intellectual should be proud of uh, being poor, right, Qingping. And usually in the ancient time, if uh, I'm poorer than you, I feel I'm more, I'm more decent than you. Now rich people feel they're humble, but now it's the opposite. And the poor people, the poor intellectuals feel humble to the rich. This is a big problem, and uh, how can we change? And we n there need a lot of uh, social work supported by the government policy. Unfortunately, at this moment, and we don't have that strong government policy to support this. And because the political slogan is still, being rich is glorious. It's not uh, being honest is glorious. The being fair is uh, uh, glorious. Now, development is a hard, what? Ying Dao Li. What was Ying Dao Li? Truth. Oh, development is a hard truth. But no one talking about uh, fair is a, <laughs> fairness is a hard, uh, hard truth. So I think we need a lot of social and political change to make the intellectuals resume their traditional function in the society. So at this moment, I cannot expect very much from a Chinese intellectual to, 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 to reform the society. But I think the positive signal is that some intellectuals already started. And possibly, the one child generation and the intellectual of that generation may resume our traditional uh, the traditional character of a Chinese uh, uh, intellectual. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.
call them. All right, may I call our uh, session to order, please? Everybody, please. I am pleased to uh, introduce Professor Nancy Bernkoff Tucker as our general commentator to deliver the wrap up remarks to our discussions of these two full days. Like Dr. Suchi, Professor Tucker received her degree from Columbia. And then, unlike Dr. Suchi, she d received her degree in history, which is, well, of course, it's important for us. Now, so she's professor of history at Georgetown University and then also a member at the uh, Edmund A. Walsh School of uh, Foreign Service. She's trained as, as, as an American diplomatic historian with a specialization in American East Asian relations, especially United States relationship with China, Taiwan, and Hong Kong. In 2007, she received a National Intelligence Award uh, Medal of Achievement for distinguished meritorious service as the first assistant deputy director of national intelligence for analytic integrity and standards and analytic ombudsman <laughs> in the office of a director of national intelligence. Now that sentence alone tells me <laughs> that we require multiple layers of decoding, uh, preferably from Professor Tucker herself to help us understand her access as well as her expertise, that is, beyond publishing books and talking to us. In 1986-1987, she served as the, uh, in the Office of uh, Chinese Affairs in the Department of State. She also served in the U.S. Embassy in Beijing, and previously she's taught at various universities. She's been a research assist, uh, associate and um, a researcher um, at a range of uh, international as well as um, uh, U.S. institutions. And she's also a member of the Council on Foreign Relations. Um, she's an international affairs fellow there. She's, of course, her research has received a broad range of uh, support. And uh, she's a member of the U.S. Department of State Advisory Committee on Historic Diplomatic Documentation. And I won't go into all the details there, except to also simply mention that she's the author of numerous books, which many of us certainly have uh, uh, read um, simply to educate ourselves on this subject. So uh, most recently, her book in 2009 is the book entitled Straight Talk, U.S.-Taiwan Relations and the Crisis with China. And before that, uh, there were also other volumes on Taiwan, Dangerous Straits, Uncertain Friendships, Taiwan, Hong Kong, and the United States, Patterns in the Dust, Chinese-American Relations, and the Re Recognition Controversy of 1949 to 1950. So um, without further ado, I invite all of you to uh, uh, help me welcome Professor Tucker. Thank you. Uh, I think that was enough. Maybe I should quit while I'm ahead. Uh, <laughs> I should also tell you, by the way, that that title all fits on a business card. And that was quite a mammoth feat. I want to thank Wen Xin for this terrific conference and for including me uh, in it. Um, I know there's been a group of you that worked over a long period of time on this, and I'm a bit of an interloper, but I'm glad to have been included because this is a terrific group and it's been a great conference. Um, I am going to do um, something probably a bit different from what Winston hoped I would do because I didn't see the papers until I uh, got here to Berkeley. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the things that matter to me and then try to uh, pull in some of what uh, we've been hearing and, and about the work um, that these um, gifted authors have done. Um, the recent announcement that Taipei will inaugurate the first of a string of Taiwan academies 
paralleling China's worldwide and influential Confucius Institutes in Los Angeles and Houston, encapsulates a critical feature of cross-strait relations that we have touched upon occasionally, but perhaps more ma marginally in the last two days, but which is at the heart of what I do, and that is the critical role of the United States uh, and the continuing competition between Beijing and Taipei to win over or at least neutralize Americans, an effort that persists in moments of confrontation and in times of cooperation. The Chinese believe that unification would have long since occurred uh, without Washington's interference. So too Taiwan, which recognizes that U.S. support has provided the space for economic and political development and the confidence to improve relations across the strait. Today, the U.S. dimension is shifting, just as the positions of uh, China and Taiwan are in flux. And as has long been the case, both Taipei and Beijing are suspicious. Taiwan worries that the United States is unhappy with improvement in cross-straits relations, regardless of U.S. reassurances, believing that the United States fears the security implications of cross-straits conciliation, freeing Beijing of a major security um, distraction and jeopardizing uh, Japanese sea lanes of supply. In addition, there's the frightening prospect that accelerated and unrestrained economic integration could handicap American companies in the China market and that military <coughs> secrets could be lost. Or alternatively, Taiwan worries that Washington is too happy about improvement in cross-straits relations, seeing that as an excuse uh, to reduce or end arms sales. That U.S. determination to preserve peace and stability could mean that Washington is prepared to sell Taiwan out uh, to secure benefits from and mollify China. Beijing, for its part, fears that the United States is engaged in a containment strategy to keep China weak and divided. At worst, this means that the United States seeks Taiwan's independence. At best, it suggests that Washington wants a status quo that precludes unification. Here, too, Washington's denials and reassurance have not worked. At the same time, Washington also is apprehensive, and its worries are fueled by two governments which are not transparent and therefore dangerous. China, as we all know, is secretive about military, governmental, and economic policies. For instance, it suspends military-to-military -military talks with the United States at the slightest excuse. And this is not simply about American arms sales to Taiwan, but also because many Chinese, particularly in the PLA, see no reason to be frank with a potential adversary about China's military weaknesses. So secrecy serves a variety of governmental purposes, but is, of course, a problem for American diplomats and military officials. Less often noticed has been Taiwan's reticence to deal openly with the United States. And I am not talking here about the sinister and manipulative China lobby of the 1940s and 50s and 60s, or uh, Chen Shui-bian's political surprises that so angered George Bush. Ma Ying-jeou is also perceived among some Americans, both in and outside of the American government, as secretive. And that's not because he doesn't publicly reveal his thoughts, but because privately he is not as candid with U.S. officials as they would like, most disturbingly on cross-straits issues like, for instance, ECFA, 
uh, where American officials were kept in the dark virtually till the eve of the announcement of ECFA and were very upset because, of course, the American business community was asking the Commerce Department or USTR, what's going to happen? And they said, we don't know. And that's not a position officials like to be put in. The United States, of course, dreads the outbreak. Oh, I should put that up. Uh, the United States dreads the outbreak of war in the Strait, which would mean virtually certainly uh, American involvement in the fighting. Of course, today, the fear of war has abated considerably. Uh, as the Wu Dittmer paper observed, uh, the U.S. is pleased by rapprochement across the strait. Having struggled for decades with the contradiction between having a one China policy but actually dealing with two Chinas or one China and one Taiwan, um, we perhaps are seeing an American version of what Shelley called uh, the China in and out, that Americans would like to have one actual uh, entity to deal with maybe simplifying the whole situation if both sides of the strait think that's a good idea. But in the meantime, the strait remains the only place in the world where two nuclear-armed great powers could go to war. Of course, uh, 2011 is not 1996 when Bill Clinton sent two aircraft carrier battle groups to monitor confrontation in the strait, but war could nevertheless come through misunderstanding, miscalculation, or accident, as well as intent. Thus, it is critical that all sides be realistic about what can be achieved, patient especially about political issues, determined to increase mutual trust, and committed to better mutual understanding. Tom Gold astutely observed yesterday that 21st century China might understand Taiwan better or simply be better at manipulating it than it was before. Taipei and Beijing, in fostering cultural vehicles to educate the US about Taiwan and China, are wisely addressing uh, what I think all of us would agree is a sad reality. Ordinary Americans know little about the dynamics of political, social, security, and economic integration across the strait. They have been paying attention to China largely because of the conviction that China is stealing U.S. jobs. Some know vaguely that Taiwan is a democracy, not governed by Beijing, that iPads, iPods, and iPhones depend upon its technology, and we heard uh, Bill Kirby's paper yesterday which explored the critical role of the Taiwan Semiconductor Manufacturing Company. But beyond this, Americans rarely know much more about Taiwan. And I will make the point in a very painful way. Just a few years ago in a survey of college-bound high school students, so these are the best and the brightest, 25% of them did not know the name of the ocean that separates the U.S. from China. <laughs> now, respondents were not asked about the Taiwan Strait. But I think it's fair to assume that the ignorance and apathy evinced about the Pacific Ocean would be at least as evident regarding the Strait. Superficiality and indifference has, of course, long historical roots, as does the mistrust around that triangle that several of our speakers have pointed to. I have, as Wenxin uh, mentioned earlier, uh, trace the distrust and ignorance that frames the triangular relationship in my book, Straight Talk. And by the way, it's newly out in paperback, so anyone who wants to leave this lecture and run to the bookstore to get the book, <laughs> it's fine with me. Okay, in the book, 
uh, which is a historical look at the U.S.-Taiwan relationship in the context of the confrontation with China. Uh, I talk, among other things, about the uh, U.S. opening, as it's called, to China. We all know that in 1969, Richard Nixon abandoned Cold War assumptions about so-called Red China and stopped pretending that the Republic of China was a bastion of American values to begin normalization with Beijing. What is critical to development since then, but has not been part of the historical literature or memory, uh, when Shin talked um, very eloquently about the changing way in which we understand Taiwan, um, I like to think I made a tiny contribution in terms of the way we understand U.S.-Taiwan and U.S.-China relations by pointing to the fact that Nixon and Henry Kissinger betrayed Taipei and Beijing in the process of normalization. How? By not demanding that the PRC renounce the use of force and pledging not to support independence or to China's. By doing these things, they left Taiwan precariously exposed and dismissed the views of Taiwan's people as though they didn't matter at all. In fact, I think probably Henry and Dick had never met somebody from Taiwan. They also, however, misled Beijing which believed that the United States had accepted the fact of the Republic of China's collapse. And so, Taiwan, the Taiwan Relations Act, uh, arms sales, uh, Ronald Reagan's six assurances, evoked outrage in China because they gave Taiwan a new and unexpected lease on life. Beijing did not think that Taiwan would be able to survive American de-recognition. And Kissinger and Nixon said, yeah, you're right. It won't and we don't care. But in fact, um, that's not the way it worked out. OK. Uh, conditions today are significantly different from and remarkably the same as in the past. As speakers here have made apparent, connections across the strait today are complex, extending to all levels of social, commercial, and cultural interaction. Travel, marriage, religion, and local politics, even smuggling and language study, are intensively exposing China and Taiwan to each other. But as Micah shows in his wonderful paper, greater integration is not necessarily good for everyone who has long been bridging the strait. Indeed, several of the papers make concretely clear that economic integration won't necessarily foster any desire in Taiwan for political union. Of course, much of this activity, uh, what Michael in his paper calls cross-straits entanglement, does not aim at excluding the United States. Nonetheless, the U.S. role in most of these initiatives is modest to non-existent. And so in this new situation, some argue that the United States would benefit from simply abandoning Taiwan. And we've talked several times about the Charles Glazer uh, article in the current foreign affairs that only spends about two paragraphs on Taiwan and says, no interest, let it go, let's focus on China. But it's not the first article of this kind in foreign affairs. Many of you will remember Bruce Gilley's argument about Finlandization, and there have been others as well. It is certainly true as uh, Yen Shui Tung has sometimes written, and I think it was a bit of a subtext in what he said, that U.S.-China relations would instantly improve uh, if the U.S. did this, walked away from Taiwan. Although the threat of conflict would not disappear, it would be much diminished. Moreover, 
Taiwan's desire for a close relationship with the United States can and has been questioned. U.S. officials voice frustration about working with Taipei. The ractopamine beef crisis uh, of the last few weeks has once again disrupted relations, as beef did before when uh, our friend Su Chi took the brunt of people's anger uh, about American selling beef in Taiwan. And in this instance now, it has meant that the long-sought uh, trade investment framework agreement talks, uh, which were on the verge of beginning, to solve some um, uh, economic problems between Washington and Taipei and perhaps move us closer to some sort of future um, kind of free trade agreement have been put on hold indefinitely. Now, it might be argued, as some do, that the Ma administration places too much importance on cross-straits relations and too little on cross-Pacific ties. But to Washington, Taiwan is nonetheless valuable economically, a useful intelligence asset, a symbol of American international credibility, an important variable in the defense of Japan, and an inspirational outpost of democracy in Asia. So it would be wrong, I would contend, to imagine the U.S. ending its role in cross-straits affairs. In 1957, a mob in Taipei pillaged the U.S. Embassy in protest against uh, continuing American racism uh, and imperialism. Uh, Taiwan's government helped spark the demonstrations, um, angered that Washington would not help the Guomindang return to the mainland. Mao Zedong witnessed these events and correctly concluded that there were deep frictions in U.S.-Taiwan relations, uh, one more reason, amongst many others, um, that he soon thereafter launched a new campaign of liberation uh, against Michael's offshore islands. But the United States is not easily discouraged or deterred. In recent years, China appears to have concluded <laughs> that the United States is in decline, that the Obama administration is weak, that Americans will remain mired in economic crisis and in Afghanistan. China has been assertive, some say truculent, or simply uncooperative on issues ranging from currency to North Korea, Iran, and Burma. The January visit of Hu Jintao to Washington was designed to repair these frayed relations. <laughs> Still, who came <laughs> – she's going to make it hard for me to talk. Still I, – I like an appreciative audience, though. Um, Still, who came demanding a fourth communique? reiteration of uh, U.S. respect for China's core interest, as well as retreat on U.S. arms sales. Barack Obama <laughs> refused to concede these points. But the papers presented here make clear that in the future, sorting out what is most beneficial for the United States, what Taiwan actually wants, and what ta China is willing to tolerate, as well as what ordinary people think of all this, will be increasingly difficult. This is not just because of the baleful influence of China on the already unreliable Taiwan media, as Tim uh, discussed earlier, but also because of the three-year uh, journey of these authors uh, which have demonstrated how profound change has been uh, across the strait. Tian Hung Mao's Mahjong diplomacy that he talked about yesterday unfortunately cannot provide Shelley Rigger's great escape. <laughs> but at least the persistence of these problems should give the book a long shelf life. Thanks.
in the day, and if nobody wants to ask any questions, my feelings will not be hurt. But <laughs> okay. well, I, I have one question. I just want to focus on your last point. What does Taiwan really want? Well, uh, there, well, there are many different voices in right. Taiwan. Yes. Uh, in my opinion, Ma Yingzhou's uh, Chinese Nationalist Party in Taiwan wants to eventually reunite with China. That's uh, that's KMT's, you know, uh, policy, state policy. However, a lot of Taiwanese. Uh, don't agree with that. So what, what Taiwan really wants, I think is very important for the United States, people of the United States to really understand. Because Taiwanese, lots of Taiwanese, you know, after struggling for democracy, you know, has achieved a degree of democracy that I believe, you know, is sides with United States' uh, true interest. Yeah, I, I would um, agree with much of what you've said. Um, I think for the United States, this is a very difficult problem. As I suggested, um, the fact that we have a one China policy but deal with one China and one Taiwan has, I think, at least on occasion, focused the minds of American officials on how you work out this continuing stalemate and the disagreement within Taiwan itself uh, over this issue. Um, I would go on to say that it is not America's position to um, come to any conclusions about which viewpoint is either the right one or the dominant one. But I think where we took a very constructive position was under Bill Clinton, uh, where towards the end of his presidency, uh, at the encouragement of Richard Bush, who was then uh, chairman of the American Institute in Taiwan, uh, Clinton said publicly that we will accept, that we have, we have no horse in this race. We will accept any conclusion that is reached by the assent of people on both sides of the strait. And to me what that means, and I believe that's what Bush was uh, trying to make the point about, is that it's the Taiwan voting public that has to make those decisions. Um, Taiwan's population is very split and pretty evenly split in many ways. Um, and so I think we're all going to be looking ahead to the 2012 elections uh, to see whether we will have yet another uh, change of party and either continue policies or, as Suu Kyi uh, suggested yesterday, continue policies but change the name of those policies. Um, but in any case, I think the American position is um, that whatever is um, uh, agreed upon by Taiwan's people is something that we can live with. And, um, I, and I think that's the right position for the United States to take. That's a tough question. Um, I guess I would say, uh, having spent a whole book talking about this uh, and having argued with a lot of people uh, about it since the book came out, um, to me, trust is essential to make international relations uh, operate properly. And yet, Looking around the globe, it is certainly the case that U.S.-Taiwan relations or U.S.-China relations are 
not in any way the only ones where mistrust uh, and suspicion are very important parts of the exchange between uh, countries. I've always felt that in the particular situation of U.S.-Taiwan relations, um, we cannot afford on either side, but particularly on Taiwan's side, uh, to be in a situation where there is so much mistrust because Taiwan, unfortunately perhaps, is so dependent on the United States and needs, I think, to be more comfortable with American policies, uh, believe that we're not going to sell Taiwan out, although we have done so in the past. Uh, and um, so I think everybody should be working much harder at the element of trust. And, and some of the authors in the book made clear that the, that lack of trust between Taiwan and China is also uh, slowing down and complicating uh, the kinds of uh, integration, social, cultural, and whatever that uh, have begun but might be working more smoothly if that wasn't interfering with it. So, um, no, I don't have a really good uh, answer to that, except that I think um, it tends to fall in the category that uh, Henry Kissinger used to use about human rights, that it would be nice to have, but it's not important enough to spend a lot of time on. Uh, I, I have a sense that a lot of diplomats look at trust that way, um, but I think at our peril. Hi. Um, can you tell us um, the, the degree of um, dissatisfaction or whatever um, among um, American officials? or working on the relationship between U.S. and Taiwan, on the lack of transparency of the Ma administration um, in dealing with China, and whether that is simply a matter of uh, displeasure with the style, or is there a deeper suspicion going on, which can only be um, increasing when the relationship between Taiwan and Beijing uh, gets closer? Um, I, that's the single most controversial thing I think I've said since I arrived in Berkeley. Um, I have, on a couple of occasions, uh, had the opportunity to talk to American officials on the economic side, on the security side, various places for different projects that I've been doing. Um, and the conclusion that I've drawn from those conversations, and in some cases people were very explicit about it, is that there is unhappiness. Um, partly because the expectation was that Ma Ying Zhou would be very forthcoming, and after the unfortunate final years of the Chen Shui Bian uh, administration, that you know, we were relieved, things were going to be better, they'd all work smoothly. Today, uh, as I've told a couple of people, there is a certain nostalgia for the first couple of years of Chun's presidency because he was more, they say, forthcoming and more willing to be candid and cooperative with uh, U.S. representatives um, that deal with Taiwan than Ma Ying Zhou has been. Uh, how much is this a question of style? I think that does, and that's a very good point, I think that does make a difference. Um, and I think Ma is a, I've, I've known him for a long time, but never well. I think he's a self-contained person. Uh, and a, apart from Su Chi, I'm not sure who else he has real trust and confidence in. Um, and that's a, that is obviously a, a very lonely place for a politician to be. I don't think he has the same trust in American officials that some others uh, in the Taiwan government have had in the past. When, when I wrote my first book on Taiwan, I pointed out that there were more American PhDs in the Taiwan government than there had ever been in the U.S. government. <laughs> Um, uh, but those kinds of close ties, I think, have fragmented uh, because of political change. And there is um, concern that there are conversations going on across the strait about which we know little. Now, 
That has happened before, and in fact, there have been, let's say, under Lee Dong Wei, secret talks. But um, particularly in a situation like ECFA, um, there was a sense that this is not the kind of thing you should be hiding from us. And if you're hiding this, then what else are you hiding that is more serious and could get us into trouble? Because the bottom line, I think, for the United States is, and, I, and not everybody in the administration would agree with me on this, but I certainly think if war breaks out in the Taiwan Strait, we will have no choice but to join in that war. And so it does make things, I think, very serious. And therefore, I think the lack of transparency is troubling. Now, not everybody in the government feels that way. Not everybody in the China watching community in Washington feels that way. But I think there are enough people who do um, that it is a problem that needs to be worked on uh, by Taipei and Washington together. Thank you, Nancy, for a very interesting talk and did a nice job of bringing in all the papers. I, I'm struck both from the discussions that we've had over the last two days and from your presentation and all the wonderful slides that there's occasional gesturing outside of either the cross-strait relationship or the tripartite relationship with the U.S. to other regional actors and issues. There are a couple of slides of North Korea and yours, mm -hmm. but it seems strikingly absent from the discussion is any mention of a role that Japan might play in this relation cross-strait relationship, uh, both looking to the past in terms of what it had done and then looking ahead to the future. Mm -hmm. So I'd love to hear your thoughts on that. Sure. I think the only point at which I mention uh, Japan is um, here. I'm almost there, yes, um, is the issue of uh, how Japan w looks at, at and would fare if um, China and Taiwan somehow came to an agreement and formed some sort of single entity. Um, again, I, and particularly, I don't talk to the upper leadership in Japan. On the other hand, they change so quickly that it <laughs> doesn't matter anyway. But um, from the you know lower level foreign ministry bureaucrats who go from one administration to another, um, I've been told on multiple occasions, we don't speak publicly on these issues. But if there's a war in the strait, we will be there. And if the US needs uh, our help, um, we will provide it. This is not an issue that will destroy the US-Japan alliance, as many people have suggested. Now, I'm not saying that Japan is going to send aircraft carriers and, and shoot and, and all of that. But there, I think there is a sense on Japan's part, and it is something that American officials think about, that Japan could be compromised significantly uh, if the situation changes. Uh, again, China has said that if there's unification, it will not put troops on Taiwan. Um, that may or may not be what ultimately happens. But there is fear, I think, in Tokyo that this could project uh, Chinese power um, further out uh, into the Pacific, that Japan is totally dependent on those sea lanes for survival. Um, some people have suggested, well, it's just a matter of shipping a little further uh, east. Uh, we just move those lanes and it's not a problem for Japan. But the expense and the difficulty of establishing new reliable routes is, is not to be ignored. So uh, Japan has, I, I think the point really is, Japan has independent reasons for being very concerned. And because Japanese uh, policy these days um, has taken a bit of a U-turn in very recent past, and, and Japan seems to be more and more alarmed by Chinese policy, I think it is uh, working harder at reaching out to Taiwan than it has in some time. I have, yeah, I have a mic. <laughs> um, <laughs> you can. I wanted to go back to the uh, 
the, the trust question is, you talked about trust, but there's another word. Well, first of all, thank you very much for a terrific presentation. Um, but the other, th and, and summing up, but the, in addition to the word trust, Beijing at least also talks about understanding, liaojie, hushang liaojie, and the idea that once we have mutual understanding, then the implication is you'll accept our point of view. That liaojie, and if you disagree with them, ha, ni bu liaojie. You don't understand. And I know that I used to be told, not only, of course, you're a foreigner, you could never possibly understand, <laughs> but there's also the, the xiang bu tong. You, and this is sort of brainwashing ideas, that once you, you, you xiang bu tong means you, know, you can't think it through. But if you can xiang tong, then you will understand that we're right. So how do you negotiate when it's always negotiating to the point where you understand, you accept their position, then we've had a successful negotiation? My understanding is that during the Hu Jintao trip, um, the question rose, what would be the um, takeaway, as they say in Washington? And um, there was, of course, in 2009, a joint statement between Washington and Beijing uh, that was signed when uh, President Obama was in Beijing. And there was instant certainly in the United States, instant criticism. Uh, a lot of people were very upset because that joint statement seemed to suggest that the United States accepted uh, China's uh, point of view on Taiwan and China's core interests. The people who negotiated that agreement said, no, no, uh, just because the paragraph on core interests and the paragraph on Taiwan followed each other, that doesn't mean that we meant to suggest that we believe Taiwan is a Chinese core interest. Okay, I say all that by way of background to say, when the Chinese came to Washington in January, they came insistent upon a new communique that would essentially reiterate what they had seen as the benefits they had gotten in the 2009 statement. You might want to notice that it was the State Department that negotiated the 2011 statement, whereas it was the White House that did the 2009. Why the change? Because the guys at the White House said, not again, not me, I'm not getting in the middle of that. So Kurt Campbell, the Assistant Secretary for East Asia, negotiated that. And some of you out there, I know Shelley, uh, knows Kurt pretty well. And Kurt is brash and outspoken, and he has a lot of support from Hillary Clinton. And he essentially walked in the room and said, we don't need an agreement. And we're not going to sign anything that reiterates these points. And I understand the Chinese were astonished <laughs> and disturbed. And so we got a very different uh, kind of agreement, which goes back to this point about understanding. I think um, the United States is not often that um, bold or in your face about our own views on some of these things. Uh, and sometimes, in the case of the Obama visit to China, um, we have communicated a message that we accept more of what China wants than we actually are. And so, you know, I, I would say that a little bit of, um, uh, a little bit more assertiveness on our part uh, might be a good thing to make clear that, that we hear what's being said, we understand what's being said, but that doesn't necessarily mean we agree with it. Okay, um, so my question kind of has to do with the trust thing. Uh, you mentioned how there had been profound changes uh, since Ma Ying-jeou took over, um, and there has been, as we've seen with the press and with the ECFA and with people being able to travel more freely. But I guess my question is, um, and, and we also talked about yesterday how the relationship is fragile. So my question is, 
are those changes that are profound, are they really solid? Or is it something that can be kind of derailed um, with some event that could happen? For example, uh, in 95, when Li Deng uh, came to visit Cornell, whatever gains had been made through 1988 and 95, they kind of disappeared. And so, yeah, my question is, is it solid or is it just looks really good because apparently from 2000 to 2008, they were non-existent? That's a great question, uh, and let me answer it, and I'll try to be brief. That's not my style, but I'll try to be brief. Um, first, that um, uh, the kinds of changes that Sarah, for instance, spoke about can't be undone because you've got all those Chinese uh, women, for example, in Taiwan, and they're going to be in Taiwan even if there's some sort of crisis. So in some very fundamental ways, changes have occurred that I think are permanent. On the other hand, my own experience would suggest that there is nothing permanent at the somewhat higher level of international diplomacy. Um, uh, when Shin mentioned that I was in the Office of Chinese Affairs, that was in the mid-1980s, which was two years before Tiananmen. And our line in the office at the time was, our relations are so matured now, are so solid and so good uh, with China that there never again will be an incident that will fundamentally fragment those relations. And people in the State Department firmly believe that, and we told everybody that. Uh, and then, of course, two years later, um, you know, everything fell apart. So I don't think there are permanent changes at the level of diplomacy, but I think that there can be permanent changes at the level of human interaction. Um, you know, MICA's um, uh, smugglers may be able to get at it again if there's a crisis and both sides get upset with each other, but there are other more fundamental things that are far harder to roll back. Well, I think uh, this is really a marvelous presentation, and uh, it's very thoughtful. And uh, if uh, I uh, can uh, just pick up some uh, a tiny defect of this uh, uh, presentation, is that they seem to me that all of the analysis uh, didn't uh, uh, give, uh, uh, give concern why America need to adjust uh, its foreign policy, or at least adjust its policy to Taiwan or to China. And, uh, uh, I agree with uh, 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 Professor Gold. Uh, communication is uh, helpful and uh, help each side to understand each other, but that means it leads to cooperation. And uh, when you understand each other, you may hate the other side even more, right? right? <laughs> and uh, so then the, the situation for Russia and the U.S., and uh, they, 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 they understand that so thoroughly, so then they, they can never be friends to each other. <laughs> and uh, so the China and U.S., from my understanding, all of this change, and mainly based on change of their interests. Or in some way, both sides make concession to each other because they need each other. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and also the same and, uh, for the relationship between the Taiwan and the US. And the US also needs something from Taiwan. <laughs> if you don't need it, you already abandoned it. So that's why the leverage from Taiwan on the US. So from my understanding, actually, this is uh, a very good uh, uh, presentation, but uh, just a little bit uh, uh, later about uh, uh, analysis uh, why US uh, uh, what the U.S. need from this to, uh, the two sides of the Taiwan Strait? I, I agree with you completely. I mean, th there has been a view for decades that the U.S. should simply abandon Taiwan. Uh, there's also the view among some that we should uh, tow Taiwan out to sea and solve the problem that way. Uh, somebody talked about geographic um, um, relocations yesterday. Um, I think you're right. Uh, that the U.S. would not continue to be involved if it didn't think it had significant interests on both sides. Um, we are not simply economically dependent on China these days, but I think there is a real feeling that after ignoring China for decades, and that was a colossal mistake, it would be super folly to follow a similar policy now. But that does not mean writing off Taiwan. And that's why I said earlier um, that it is not our place to try to sort out the confrontation. Um, I think we understand 
I don't think it's a question of having to repeat things again. I think we understand. I think it's simply that we are not going to take sides. Certainly, I personally hope we don't. I think this is your issue to work out. Uh, yeah, well, yeah, thank you, uh, thank you, Wenxin. Uh, Ke aside, all right, I'm going to make a <laughs> couple points. Uh, first of all, on um, uh, Dr. Yen, Dr. Yen's point earlier uh, on the, the power ratio between U.S. and China, I, uh, I, uh, it is my understanding, uh, of course I'm not an expert on this one, but I think uh, uh, people in the U.S. tend to underestimate self and China Many people in China tend to overestimate itself. Uh, I think Chinese economy will s uh, surge ahead at a rapid state for five years, maybe seven. Yeah, I would say seven years, maybe. But beyond that, uh, all the way to 2030, I, I would put a big question mark on that. So it's not a, it's not going to be linear uh, development. Uh, there'll be uh, zigzag fluctuation. So. So that kind of power, power, power ratio may not be uh, as as um, uh, as optimistic as uh, Dr. Yen described. Another thing has to do with uh, Chinese uh, perception of U.S. role in cross-strait relations. Uh, I disagree uh, mainly because I think many people in China um, uh, don't quite understand that. From Taiwan's point of view, U.S. plays a positive role in cross trade, including in promoting rapprochement with China, because the more uh, the the uh, U.S. role is not blocking, U.S. is not play blocking uh, arms sales is not blocking uh, the the cross trade or the unification or uh, or U.S.-China relations. It's actually it's giving uh, confidence to people in Taiwan. So in that way. Uh, the U.S. the presence of U.S. role uh, strengthens Taiwan's confidence in pursuing uh, rapprochement and political talks and whatever in 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 uh, with with China. This uh, this is a uh, this uh, this is a misunderstanding uh, prevalent in many many uh, Chinese friends I have uh, I've talked with I have the articles I have read. Uh, my third point has to do with. Uh, Nancy's point earlier about um, you know uh, sh she said so uh, in no uncertain terms that uh, that if something breaks up uh, China the uh, U.S. will be there. This is a point I haven't heard for a long time, <laughs> <laughs> at least ever since 2005 or 2006. Of course, at the time the situation was different because I understand U.S. didn't want to to uh, give any give Bay Central Bay administration any wrong idea that we will be there as you know even if you. You go crazy, but uh, but that uh, silence, uh, I think, uh, you know, uh, supported by Rand study, by by some Paycom people, by all kinds of analysis, uh, uh, do pay be do uh, you know make some people think and rethink on, on this issue. Of course, I don't think you you know U.S. don't want to be trapped, but uh, this is an issue we we still I think at least for me we I continue to pay lot of attention to and uh, uh, security for Taiwan is very important because uh, this gives us confidence this is not going to retard uh, political talks as I said I think it would would strengthen Taiwan's confidence in approaching China uh, on the point of trust I I am I may be pre prejudicial but uh, in my view um, uh, in the first two years, uh, maybe beyond, maybe beyond, uh, we had uh, excellent, I would say excellent, uh, mutually trusting relationship with, with Washington. Uh, communications were, uh, were were rapid and uh, intensive. Uh, but uh, perhaps the mood in Washington has changed due to due to China, the change in China-U.S. relationship last year. This is why I argued like yesterday that uh, if U.S.-China relations continue to tense up, uh, 
we in Taiwan would be caught in between. Uh, China would be more suspicious. U.S. would be su more suspicious. We say something, we don't say something. It's, you know, it's always been uh, been seen if through a jaundiced eye. And uh, but I, I I would still call it. Uh, I would still I do still call the trusting relation between my administration and Washington is in, if not excellent, but still very good. Thank you. I feel much better about that, actually. <laughs> um, just one quick point. Um, I agree with um, what you said, um, and China itself has said they expect 7 percent growth in this next year rather than the normal double digit. It may be double digit anyway, but, but I certainly think some of the forecasting suggests some slowdown in China. But the point that I really wanted to, to say something about um, was the question of will the U.S. be there. Um, I think it, it entirely depends on how conflict uh, were to develop, and I think under present circumstances there's not going to be um, a forceful confrontation, so I think we've all relaxed a good bit. I worry about the complacency that follows from that. I mean, um, Dr. Yen said a, a few minutes ago that he could not foresee ways in which this could be resolved without the use of force. But your conclusion wasn't that therefore there will be a use of force, but that could be the conclusion uh, from what you said. So, you know, I think that is a variable out there. Those 1900 missiles pointing at Taiwan are not there just for show. Um, they serve a purpose. Um, so I think there's danger. Would the U.S. get involved? I think we would find we had no choice and that a lot of those members of Congress who today are paying very little attention to Taiwan um, would find it very hard to walk away from a democracy under attack by one of the few remaining communist powers in the world. Now, that doesn't mean that they wouldn't walk away if tai Taiwan provoked it. If Taiwan was clearly seen as causing it, I think we would head for the hills. <laughs> I don't think we would be there. But if it was perceived that China had just lost patience or had decided it was strong enough and that the U.S. was too weak, then I think we would have a lot of trouble staying out. I mean, you know, good Lord, we got involved in, we've been involved in so many places in the world. The one thing that Ho Chi Minh was always worried about was that the U.S. didn't know where Vietnam was. I wish he had been right. So, you know, we do have this unfortunate habit, and, and so I do still believe that the U.S. would, even if it didn't want to, end up being involved if it was seen as a pro an unprovoked attack on Taiwan. Well, uh, thank you. I, I was very, very delighted to hear what uh, Nancy has to say, uh, uh, particularly about a point that the United States uh, probably will not <coughs> uh, be an innocent or indifferent player in terms of the cross-strait uh, crisis should that ever occur. And it is also uh, a pleasure to hear a historian uh, to comment on such a, you know, a current current issues, uh, mostly um, dealt with by strategists, political scientists, etc. So, uh, having said that, I I thought that I perhaps I add a few comments uh, to what I have heard um, and. Uh, for Dr. Su Chi, we, we are not only uh, long-time friends, we live in the same neighborhood. So I'm very familiar with his view and uh, what you have heard from him uh, probably is precisely what President Ma's uh, official policy. <laughs> so my, I cannot claim to represent anybody except myself and half of my wife. <laughs> and so what, what I did say earlier, uh, yesterday uh, is my point of view. My point of view essentially is to call attention to the dynamic process going on across the street. Uh, 
we don't know what Washington is really thinking. And the change of administrations and the very able uh, staff, each president uh, put together uh, very frequently, are uh, very um, foreign to us in Taiwan. We don't know what they think, you know, et cetera. It's a very complicated process. And we know uh, even less about what the Chinese leadership are thinking. Um, so uh, there is a lot of ga guessing game. Uh, what I could and did uh, provide you with very little I know about across the affairs is the dynamic process that has transpired between both sides uh, that constitute a very clear trend. You know, a very clear trend. That's something, something that deserve a very, very serious thinking about it, <coughs> with uh, with considerable political uh, implications in the future. I don't know. You need to wait for eight years <coughs> uh, for anything uh, serious to happen. Uh, I appreciate uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Yen's uh, very straightforward presentations, uh, which is very rare among scholars from China that I have, I have heard. And um, I think his uh, comment uh, draw our attention uh, to the fact that the fate of Taiwan is really decide, decided by uh, the equations or, uh, or you know, uh, compatibility between the U.S. and China's economic and military powers. Uh, that's very sad uh, for Taiwan. You know. mm -hmm. um, but the uh, projection uh, about the future is always uh, very difficult. I am not one of those futuristic uh, scholars. Uh, when I was in graduate school, uh, I was taught by one of my professors not to project anything beyond five years. Since going back to Taiwan, I thought one year is pretty long. And, you know, things do change very rapidly. And, and so, in some way, um, what uh, Dr. Yen said uh, is extremely interesting to me. Uh, that, is that is to say that maybe I should go back to Taiwan and sleep uh, quietly and nicely for seven years. Don't have to worry about what may happen across the Taiwan, Taiwan Strait. But things may not be that simple. Things may not be simple. One of the things we worry about is precisely the, the thought that may be going uh, through the minds of the emerging uh, new leadership. I don't know, that will be the leadership of the one-child policies or uh, slightly older than that. Um, perhaps uh, Dr. Yen can instruct us a little bit more about what he means by the one-child generations. Who are they? What age bracket are we talking about? What will be the major characteristics of the people in that generation insofar as their uh, view about Taiwan and the United States are concerned. But I do know that the emerging generations of Chinese leaders uh, in their day 50s and mid 50s, uh, these are people who uh, have their career experiences in various cities and uh, provinces where they have worked hand in hand with Taiwanese investors. Uh, many uh, Taiwanese businessmen uh, claim uh, to know uh, personally uh, the emerging leaders quite well. Uh, and I don't know uh, uh, to what extent uh, such a personal interaction uh, may have impact on their views of the future of Taiwan. At any rate, I also uh, noticed the fact that like Beijing uh, is putting a good deal of policies in terms of trying to influence the thinking of people in Taiwan by, by cultivating uh, closer relations between both sides, 
uh, by shaping their attitude toward China, you know. So clearly, uh, it seems to me that the policy emphasis is not on developing China's military and economic mind eight years from now alone. I think they may have different kinds of agenda. I don't know. We are uh, just guessing. I present my view as a scholar, but I'd like to hear uh, what uh, Dr. Yan uh, may uh, wish to comment further. And, and I think uh, he's a fairly optimistic assessment of the next few years. Uh, has a deep impression on me. Thank you, uh, Wunxin, and thanks everybody. Uh, uh, but I wish I have uh, contributed more than I have. But anyway, thank you. Well, with that set of remarks, I would like to uh, bring our conference to a close. I would like to thank Nancy, first of all, for a terrific set of uh, final remarks and uh, thank all of you, um, our featured speakers, as well as all of those uh, who are merely scholars, not particularly distinguished, as, as Michael uh, put it the other day, for, our co for, um, for uh, two days of uh, discussion. So as we got things started yesterday, we were thinking, or as a group among ourselves, we were thinking in a terms of, say, people uh, getting married, uh, people uh, finding their deities and going to temples, reporters talking about the other side, uh, fishermen wondering about smuggling, or Jinmen County uh, politicians debating on whether to build a bridge or not. In other words, it's about everyday life on an ordinary basis and people going around making their own local calculations. But of course, with the presence of our distinguished speakers, we sharpen our sensitivity to how that a multitude of people going about their everyday business is also a situation of how that a, multi a multitude of people finding themselves situated in these global events on, of the magnitude of war and peace, and these are issues sometimes which can, which can be thought of from strategic angles through historical analysis, uh, be calculated on the basis of models of aspirations, but then sometimes it also makes sense to take half a step back to think about the projections of the economy 20 years into the future, to think about the reconfiguration of this planet 30 years from now, and to think about a global community of value, communication, trust, understanding, over issues of identity as well as interest. So with that as a set of, um, uh, just as a way of sharing what I gained out of our discussions, I would like to thank all of you for your attention, for your participation, for your contribution. Thank you. And uh, meeting adjourned.